Okay, so it looks like my presentation is getting loaded. Um, it's great to be here in Western Colorado. Thanks for having me. I'm going to talk about Colorado's economy overall, um, specifically in the context of the oil and gas industry. I'm going to talk about the oil and gas industry, um, the trends we're seeing in the industry, and our projections going forward. Um, and also, that includes our projections for energy prices. And then I'll conclude with some information on our projections for tax revenue derived from the oil and gas industry. Much of that revenue goes to local governments. So to start out, um, just a big picture here of um, oil and gas drilling rigs in the state over time, um, back to 2011. Um, so this is the number of operating oil and gas rigs in the state. Um, so areas with larger amounts of oil and gas production across the country did better coming out of the Great Recession than other areas. Um, just the, the production growth, um, the boom in that industry helped create more jobs, create more money flowing into the economy. And Colorado um, was one of those places that was fortunate to have a better rebound from the re Great Recession. Um, but you can see um, there was a large decline in oil and gas rigs, um, really starting around the beginning of 2015, following the large decline in oil prices during the fall of 2014, when oil prices basically were dropped in half from about $100 a barrel to $50 a barrel. Um, so at the peak, um, we were, had about 77 oil and gas rigs operating in the state. Um, a lot of those were concentrated in, in Weld County, northeast Colorado. Um, but they're scattered in other areas as well, inclu including the Western Slope, um, Southwest Colorado. Um, so mo most recently, we're down to about se 17 rigs, down from 77 in the fall of 2014. Um, it seems like that's kind of where we're bottoming, at, bottoming out. Um, that's a pretty low level of rigs operating in the state. Um, and we kind of seem like we've stabilized at that level um, over the past month or so. Okay, so there was a lot of concerns and questions regarding what would happen to Colorado's economy overall um, with this you know, contraction of the oil and gas industry, with this drop in drilling rigs across the state and, and job loss. Um, there was questions about you know, what would we see the 1980s again in Colorado. Um, so this looks at a graph of unemployment in Colorado during the, the 1985-1986 period when oil prices dropped substantially, similar to what they've done recently. Um, unemployment in Colorado um, increased um, at the same time that the national economy continued to grow and unemployment for the nation actually continued, continued to drop. So the drop in, in oil and gas prices in the 1980-85-86 period really had a big effect on Colorado. So there was again concerns whether this would happen again in this period. So what did happen? Um, this shows a, you know, a similar graph but now for this period. Oil prices again dropped significantly starting in the fall of 2014. But unemployment didn't increase. It actually continued to decrease. And right now, Colorado's unemployment rate for the state overall is 2.9%, which is like the third lowest among, among all states, and really kind of the lowest among bigger, bigger economies. So Colorado's economy kind of weathered the oil and gas contraction um, better than it did in the 1980s, um, and better than a lot of other states are doing now. And that's attributable to a lot of diverse industries in the state that are continuing to grow and have a lot of momentum. Um, so the contraction in the oil and gas industry, a lot of the workers were able to reallocate and go to other growing industries. So our unemployment rate has continued to stay low. Um, all, a lot of oil and gas workers probably also left different regions of the state as well. So again, I'm trying to give a kind of a big picture of Colorado in the oil and gas industry. This just shows the portion of oil and gas as a portion of the economy overall for the state. Um, about 5% of the economy, and this is 2013 data, so the percentage would be lower now that the oil and gas industry has, has contracted. Um, so it's not insignificant, but it's a relatively small part of the economy. Um, of course, this is for the state overall, and some areas of the state are going to have a larger portion of the oil and gas industry being part of their economy. Um, so Chris might, might be talking a little bit about that going forward. So it's a relatively small por portion of the economy, but I mentioned that oil and gas was a big portion or part of Colorado's rebound from the Great Recession. This graph tries to show the growth in total wages paid in the state from 2009 to 2014, so coming out of the Great Recession. 
how much of that growth in total wages was due to oil and, the oil and gas industry? Um, and we looked at some data, and about 8% directly from the oil and gas industry's growth um, contributed you know, to total wages growth in the state. Looking at the multiplier effect of the industry, um, which is you know, economic activity in other industries as a result of the oil and gas industry, you know, the spending, the, the high wages paid to oil and gas kind of ripples through the economy and helps other industries, another 5% of the growth. So about 13% of the growth in Colorado's economy, essentially, came from the oil and gas industry from 2009 to 2014. So that's a pretty significant portion. <clears throat> so w we were going to feel that when it goes away. Um, and, this, and, we, and we did. And this kind of helps illustrate that. Um, the, the dark green line shows total job growth year-over-year year job growth in the state starting in 2014. And Colorado really had among the top job growth rates in the country in 2014. Um, it was about 3%, about the upper 3%, upper close to 4% over that time. Um, the gold line is the mining sector, trends in the job, jobs in the mining sector. Um, you can see a sharp decline in mining jobs starting at the beginning of 2015. And about when that started, overall job growth in the state started to slow, down to about 2.5%. Um, and what's, what's noteworthy is that th those, those declines in the mining sector and the overall slowing in job growth has kind of stabilized. So we're thinking that really the state overall has kind of weathered the big contraction in the oil and gas industry. I know some, some areas are certainly hurting much more than others. Um, but for the state overall, um, the state is weathering the, the contraction much better than a lot of area, other areas. <clears throat> okay, so this looks at oil and gas drilling rigs and the relationship with mining or oil and gas jobs as well. Um, you can see there's a close relationship. Um, when, when oil and gas rigs increase, mining or oil and gas jobs increase as well. Um, and you can see the sharp contraction um, starting in 2015. And I just wanted to show this because this shows our projections for the rest of this year. Those are, those are the dashed lines. Um, just, to, just to highlight, this is not showing a, an increase in rigs and an increase in jobs. It's really showing less of a decline. You can see that we're still below that, that zero mark. So we're still experiencing loss in rigs and loss in jobs, but the decline is not as severe as it was in 2015. In 2015, I think um, oil and gas jobs, we lost about 7,000. Um, for 2016, we're expecting more around 3,000. <clears throat> um, this shows initial claims in the unemployment insurance program for oil and gas industry jobs. Um, there was a spike at the beginning of 2015 um, when the industry really started laying off people. Um, you can see that kind of declined over the year, and we saw another spike at the beginning of 2016 when oil prices um, softened a little bit more. Um, but you can see the spike is less than it was in 2015, so that kind of corroborates our projection that we're going to see less of a decline this year. Um, just some more information on trends in the oil and gas industry. Um, this shows production levels of oil. Um, both for Colorado and the U.S. Colorado is the darker green line, and the nation overall is, is the green line. The gold line is oil prices over time. It's remarkable that the sharp uptick in oil production from Colorado, and all, almost all of that happened from Weld County. <clears throat> in fact, I think the growth in oil production um, recently has exceeded all the oil produced in Wyoming. Um, so just a huge amount of oil production growth from Weld County. Um, what's also remarkable is the growth continued um, in, oil, in 2015, despite you know, low oil prices, a sharp decline in drilling rigs. Um, it's, it was a little bit of a surprise to a lot of people. Um, and I think it has a lot to do with that. The area of Weld County is a really highly productive producing region for oil, um, just more cost effective for a lot of producers, um, able to get more oil out of the ground at a, better, at a more cost effective price. Um, but you do see oil production kind of leveling off more recently, and we do expect declines going forward. Okay, so I notice here that there's a problem with my, my graph. That's always fun. Um, but, but this just shows kind of the, our projections for oil prices and why. 
Um, the, the gold line is oil prices over time. And the green bars are the, the balance between supply and demand of oil <laughs> worldwide. Um, so when the green bars are below, going below the zero line, that's when demand for oil or consumption of oil is exceeding production in, of oil worldwide. And so, you know, economists love supply and demand. It's a very powerful tool for looking at, for looking at how the world works. Um, and with, you know, demand exceeding supply that was pushing up oil prices over time. Um, as you can see, starting in 2014, supply really started to outpace um, consumption of, of oil worldwide. That had the effect of lowering oil prices significantly. Um, and that's really the uh, effect of, of two forces. Um, strong oil production growth from North America, resulting from the shale boom and hydro hydraulic frac fracturing. Um, and then slow down in d demand for oil consumption worldwide, mostly as a result of um, slow down in emerging economies worldwide, notably China. Um, so you can see that supply is going to continue to outpace demand going forward over the next few years in a, in a pretty large degree, and that's going to keep prices low. Um, that's, our, that's our educated projection at this time. Um, that's our best guess for what we know about the world right now. Lots of things can change. There could be, you know, turmoil in the Middle East, disruptions in oil supplies, um, but those are things that are, that are very impossible to predict. <clears throat> so this is natural gas, so a very similar story. Um, natural gas prices are more set by, in the U.S. market, not the world market. Again, um, more demand in relation to supply, hoping prices higher um, from 2001 to 2010 period. Then supply really started to outpace demand, pushing prices lower. And that's what we expect to continue over the next few years. <clears throat> OK, so moving on to what does this mean for, for tax revenue to local governments derived from the oil and gas industry? So this is assessed value from oil and nas natural gas production. So assessed value that's used for determining property tax collections. Um, this shows assessed value from oil and natural gas uh, from 2001 through our projections for, for 2018. Um, you can see the Great Recession during the 2009 period where oil and gas production value declined significantly. Um, and then again recently, um, starting this year. Um, so people familiar with the property tax, property taxes, you, you'll know that there's a lag between actual activity and tax revenue. And that's because um, assessed value is really based on the production value in the year prior. Um, so that's why there's a, there's a peak in 2015, despite the drop in oil prices. What we're seeing is the drop in assessed value really in 2016 and 2017. So we're still a lot of um, pain to come in property tax collections from oil and gas going forward. You can see even through 2018, there's a slight rebound um, just to a gradual increase in prices, um, but still at very low levels. Okay, so that was total oil and gas production assessed value statewide. Um, this map came from my friends at the Legislative Council, which is the, the economist for the General Assembly. Um, they did a map looking at, at total assessed value projections by school district. So this isn't just oil and gas production or oil and gas assessed value. It's all types of properties, residential, industrial, commercial, and oil and gas, um, and some others. Um, but you can see when, where areas where there's a high concentration of oil and gas production, that's outweighing you know, other, other assessed value properties and causing a significant decline. So white, white and red areas are where there's declines in assessed value projected in different school districts across the state. <clears throat> Not a surprise that a, larger, the, a lot of the larger declines are in, are in northeast Colorado and eastern Colorado. Okay, so state severance tax revenue. So this is the severance tax that's um, applied to uh, mineral extraction in the state. So oil and gas is the largest contributor to this revenue source, um, but also coal production and, and mineral, uh, metallic minerals as well. Um, so state severance tax revenue is, goes to the Department of Local Affairs, half of it, and then the other half goes to the Department of Natural Resources. The Department of Natural Resources it uses it for various natural resources related programs um, and also for regulation of the oil and gas industry. The other half goes to the Department of Local Affairs, which is distributed to local governments. So it's a very volatile revenue source. Um, it's always 
fun to look at this graph. Um, I've tried to argue in the past that we should get severance or a hazard pay for having to project this revenue. <laughs> um, it's just very difficult to project. Um, that's due to the, the nature of the oil and gas industry and, and energy prices being volatile because the severance tax is based on income earned from oil and gas production. And it's also because of the ad valorem tax credit that severance taxpayers can claim, um, which is based on the value of oil and gas production. Um, so when energy prices are, are moving up and down, that can create a lot of volatility in severance tax revenue. And that's what we're seeing now. Um, a strong drop in severance tax revenue this fiscal year. Um, and then a, a slight rebound going forward as energy prices start to gradually rebound and that severance tax credit starts to become less of a, less of a factor weighing down severance tax revenue. But again, still at very low levels going forward compared to the past. Um, state federal mineral leasing revenue. Um, this is revenue derived from production on federal lands, um, the state share of that revenue. Um, so a very similar picture to state severance tax revenue. It's just a little bit less volatile because it doesn't have that tax credit. Um, so again, a, a strong decline um, over the past year or so, continuing into fiscal year 16, um, and then a gradual rebound as energy prices gr you know, gradually rebound. Uh, that's all I wanted to go over. Um, I'm not sure if we wanted to go right into Chris or... I'll tell you what, why don't we say... If you have questions, we can get, take a couple right now, and then um, we'll go to Chris, and then we'll be back up here for more questions as well. So, any questions? Go ahead. Why do you anticipate the slight uptick in severance taxes? So, uh, it's mostly driven by a slight rebound in, in oil and gas prices. Just you know, um, we're projecting, I think, to average. Um, $40 a barrel this year and then slightly increase for to $45 a barrel. Um, but that coupled with lower severance tax credits. So really what's driving a big portion of the severance tax collections down this fiscal year is high tax credits from higher production values in the past. And so we're gonna have less of that effect going forward as the severance tax credits are much lower in value and will decrease severance tax revenue less than they are now. So a little bit of a rebound in energy prices coupled with much smaller tax credits. Do you have an opinion or can you figure out which might go up first, the natural gas or oil? Um, that's something I haven't thought about too, too much. Um, it, it's, so natural gas prices are very much determined, you know, in the U.S. market, not not globally as oil prices are. Could you repeat the question, please? Oh, I'm sorry. Thanks. So the, que the question was, natural gas prices or oil prices, which one will de rebound first? Um, uh, uh, I mean, it, it seems like there's both an over there's an oversupply problem for both. Um, and they probably will, it seems like they're kind of on a similar timeline for re rebounding um, as the, the imbalance kind of works its way slowly, slowly off. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, I've been reading where energy efficiencies uh, globally are being implemented at such a level that's starting to reduce demand. Are you looking into traditional demand numbers or are you adjusting demand numbers? So the question is, how is demand worldwide for energy, oil, and gas being affected by increased efficiency? Um, so our projections for, for demand and supply are, are really based on the Energy Information Administration from the federal government. Um, we rely heavily on them, and, and they you know, spend a lot of time looking at those type of issues. Um, certainly energy efficiency is improving, especially in more advanced economies. Um, I think I read recently that advanced economies are, are using less carbon maybe this year than, than last year. Maybe that's the first time ever where the carbon consumption decreased. But emerging economies that are less, less advanced, you know, more um, manufacturing based, um, less affluent, aren't, aren't as energy efficient. Um, and that's really what's gonna drive a lot of the consumption growth for both oil and gas going forward. 
that will outweigh, I think, the efficiency gains. Go ahead. I noticed on your graph of excess capacity. I know in the 1980s we had as much as 11 percent excess capacity in total production. Now we're only at 1.8 percent, right? And your trend tended to go down. And some people are predicting by the second quarter of 2016 will be at equilibrium or balance, and then we should see prices go back up. So why, why aren't you looking at that? So th that is something that people are starting to think more and more, that we might maybe seeing a turning point in the supply-demand imbalance where demand is starting to, to start outpacing supply. Um, that will help prices increase. Um, I guess my answer to that is it's, it's, it's uncertain, you know, where, where things are going. Um, and, and that's just our best guess, especially relying on the Energy Information Administration, what they're seeing. Um, but projections change as new information comes online, and that very well could be the case where energy prices rebound faster than people are, most people are thinking. Go ahead. Wait, wait, wait. Wait for the microphone. <laughs> Please. Who's <the> speaking? <laughs> all right. And as you all think you're going to ask a question, raise your hand so we can get the microphone to you uh, in a timely manner. Thank you. Yes, my question has to do with the direct distribution to local governments. Uh, total dollar-wise, what is your projection uh, compared to 2015 numbers for 2016 and 2017? So I don't have those numbers off the top of my yeah. head. If you can wait, when we get to my presentation, I'll actually tell you what that is. It's obviously less, but we have some projections on that, but it would be easier then because we have it on the slides, if that's okay. Would you agree that uh, your unemployment numbers for the state look, uh, you know, very good, but uh, uh, those numbers look substantially different over here in Western Colorado? Yes, yeah, certainly, certainly agree. We look at all areas of the state um, when we're looking at the economy, um, and I get. I just wanted to provide an overview for Colorado. Um, I think Chris was going to provide a little bit more information about, you know, on some regional differences. Um, certainly, the Western Slope is is struggling much more than than, uh, than the, the Front Range of of Colorado. Um, it actually does have a relatively low unemployment rate, um, but that's you know because the a lot of labor force has you know has left um, just to a lot, due to a lack of opportunity. So it's actually experiencing some job loss, I believe, is what the most recent information is showing us. So certainly, you know. Economic perform performance across the state is, is very divergent depending on the different attributes of the state, of the, of the area. So if it's okay, folks, we'll go ahead and switch out. Uh, again, we'll have more opportunities for questions. So Chris, you're up. 